Once upon a time, there was a monster. Half man, half lion, but all warrior. A creature bred for nothing but warfare, and his name was Ermalula. Now, you might think you already know how this story's gonna go, because when we hear myths about monsters, they often end the same way. Perseus beheads Medusa, St. George slays the dragon, Termoglocklin drives his dagger through the heart of a giant otter, etc. As stories go, these endings are pretty easy, and they ensure that you and I don't have to be scared that, say, Grendel is still out there chomping on folks with his mom, because in these tales, nobody lets a monster live too long before they kill it. Not to mention, that quick death often gives the monster an easy way out, and we never have to ask the very interesting question of, what if Grendel, or the cannibalistic Wendigo, or the Oni had to atone and keep living in the world that they, by their actions, made a darker place? Now, to me, that's quite the interesting quandary, and one that we will be taking a non-lethal stab at with today's myth. Because it's not a story of Ermalula, the Lion Man of Babylon, meeting his death at the hands of some shirtless hero. <laughs> oh no. This is a story about a monster getting a job. <laughs> Thanks so much to Factor for showing us that great tasting, fast, and fresh meals are no myth. The tale of Ermalula begins at the beginning of fire, and water, and wind, and sky, and night, and day, and mankind, basically the beginning of all creation. Of course, some time back, sitting around this very animated campfire, we told you a bit of this story about the Babylonian creation myth, the Enuma Elish, in which the unruly and rambunctious new gods rose up against their ancestors in an epic war to control the pre-universe. In that battle, the greatest of the new gods, Marduk, took up arms against the oldest god of all, his great-grandmother, Tiamat. Now, most of the time, when a young man tells us he's going to fight his ancient grandmother, we think that sounds horrible and alert the proper authorities, but Tiamat was no ordinary grandmother. And she didn't need anyone's pity. She was a serpent formed from pure chaos. To defend against Marduk, she gave birth to eleven hedonist creations. An exalted serpent, a great dragon, a furious snake, a bull man, a fish man, a lion man, a scorpion man, really any animal she could mash up with a man she did. These were the first of her children, not to be gods. They weren't made to have aspirations or wills or lives of their own. They were bred to be weapons, to fight wars, and to win them. But then they lost. Yeah, Marduk wiped the floor with Tiamat and her monsters too. From her corpse, he created heaven and earth. He squeezed the blood from the body of her consort, and with it made a race of men. And as for the monsters, subjugated but still alive, Marduk had them bound to his feet. Which seemed like a pretty good move at the time, but did get old rather quickly. So, what was Marduk to do with a weaponized bestiary full of bullmen and deadly dragons? Again, the easy answer would have been just to send his eleven monstrous great-granduncles to the old imaginary farm upstate. But he didn't want to do that. These monsters hadn't chosen to fight on a losing side. They weren't fundamentally evil or good, but they might have potential. Could they, he wondered, do more than just kill? Could they learn to be something more? Well, Marduk thought so. And so he made them doormen. The fishman Kulalu worked as a bouncer at the Temple of Nabu, god of literacy. And Gurtablilu, the scorpion man, watched over the rising and setting of the sun at the twin peaks of the sun god's mountain residence. Of course, these weren't flashy jobs, not compared to Marduk's friends who were getting gigs like building Babylon or ruling the universe, but it was important work, and there was dignity in it. Heck, if someone murders the sun in its bed, the whole world falls apart, so thank the gods for that scorpion man. In this way, through service, Tiamat's brood became productive members of society. Monsters were destigmatized. Babylonians adorned their houses with the monsters' images as protections from evil, and the monsters, for their part, actually lived lives. They married, reproduced, and made a future for their kind as guardians of the universe. So when it came time for Ermalula the Lion Man to get a call from the ancient Babylonian recruitment agency, his hopes were reasonably high. He flexed his mighty muscles, tossed his club in the air. <laughs> Would he be beating back intruders at the gates of the god of death? Perhaps he'd be sent to thwart scoundrels scheming to murder the sun. Ooh, do we have an exciting opportunity for you, Ermalula, came the call from the gods. Tell me, have you ever heard of the toilet? I'm sorry, what? Oh, he heard correctly. He was made the guardian of toilets. Ermalula didn't quite know what to say. What did the role entail exactly, he asked the gods. What were his responsibilities? To which the gods sort of just shrugged and said, Just make sure nothing happens in there that's not supposed to happen, you know? 
Of course, in those days, that meant toilets in the homes and palaces of the upper class, because only the wealthy or noble could afford them. But of course, if Urbalula wanted to also patrol the fields to help out any squatting commoners, hey, I mean, that was totally up to him. Have fun with it, the gods encouraged him. Really, make it your own. What an outrage. Urmalula was a true-born warrior bred for battle. To fight with club and claw. Not wait in a bathroom with warm towels while rich men hit the potty. But it was the god's will. And thus, his lot. One miserable night in the lavatory, he considered that his fate was the very worst that could ever befall a fearsome monster. Even death would have been preferable. Perhaps he should rise up against the gods, as Marduk once did, rather than suffer this disrespect. But then, he heard something. The blood-curdling snarl of a lion, who crept into the room on its hind legs. This beast walked like a man. I am Shulak, he said. Welcome to the battlefield! Shulak, it turned out, was a demon whose sole desire was to wreak illness and death on those who used the toilet. The second anyone sat down to do their business, that's when Shulak struck. He'd been known to bite or pump people full of air until they died, to cause strokes, to possess people through their nether regions, and cause epilepsy in their children. But why? asked Ermalula. I am a lion man, Sulak cried. I am bred to fight, to kill, like all lion men. That is, all but the bathroom attendant I see before me. <laughs> And it was at that very tense moment that a nobleman came in to use the toilet. The lion men exchanged glances. Shulok bore his fangs, flexed his claws, and pounced. And it was only in that split second that Ermalula had to decide who he was. He leapt and met his airborne nemesis with a swing of a club and a lustful roar. He was the guardian of the toilet! And friends, they've waged war like this for millennia, in your toilets and mine, with neither having struck the final blow against their foe. Of course, in the crossfire, the demon has claimed some high-profile targets, to be sure. King George II, Elvis Presley, Judy Garland, all fell to Shulok's sinister paws. But if you look at the full breadth of human history, statistically, out of every human that has died ever, very few of them have died on the toilet. So, overall in the cosmic battle between good and evil, on the potty front at least, good is most assuredly winning. And who do we have to thank for that? Just a monster. A beast bred to have no will or life of his own. A being created just to fight. And fight he does for all eternity as your warrior, your guardian. And you know, I think he's gloriously happy. So long as you remember to wash your hands. And look, added bonus, once your digits are squeaky clean, you're all set to enjoy one of Factor's delicious meals delivered right to your door. Ooh, is this mahogany? So the summertime is always just super slammed for me. What with getting all these shows out on time, seeing friends and family, and to be honest, trying to finish my current slate of games before the fall shows up in no time to further decimate my schedule. Meaning I don't have a lot of time to cook. And sure, I could always order takeout a bunch, but my bank account lives in constant fear of that financial nightmare. And frozen meals have too many preservatives and to be honest, honest just kind of tastes like sadness. Well, this is precisely where Factor comes in to save me. They're my absolute favorite ready-to-eat meal delivery service that takes the guesswork out of my breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Every meal is ready in two minutes with no prep, no mess, no cleanup, just good dang food ready when I have time to eat it. Not to mention, Factor has a really delicious rotating menu of over 30 chef-prepared, dietitian approved meal options for you to choose from each week to achieve any nutrition goals you may have. They got keto, protein plus, veggie, vegan options, calorie smart, which are meals around 550 calories or less, and a bunch more. And you can even mix and match between all of those options to ensure that everyone in your household gets the exact type of food that they love fast. For instance, a few days ago, I absolutely devoured their chimichurri pork tenderloin, which, by the way, tasted way too good for how little time it took. That was a happy mat right there. And then I got to use the time I saved to film this next totally unnecessary but completely necessary B-roll shot about how much I love their smoothies. God, they're so good, I don't have a problem, you have a problem. 
So now that the weather's heated up, if you want to eat better while also just being better with your time, all you gotta do is head to factor75.com or click the link below and then use the code extra credits 50 to get 50% off your first factor box. Then not only will you be getting fast, tasty meals that fit your lifestyle, but you'll also be helping to support our shows and the people who make them. Thank you very much for that. Again, that is 50% off your first box at factor75.com when you use that code extra credits 50. Say, did you ever hear the one about Skylar Holmes, Kuya Koi, Joseph Blame, Dominic Valenciana, Casey Mustia, Arcolite Games, Angela Valenciana, and Ahmad Ziad Turk being fantastic legendary patrons? Because I sure did. 